Live from the Moscone Convention Center in San Francisco, California, it's The Cube at Oracle Open World 2014. Brought to you by headline sponsor, Cisco Systems, with support from NetApp. And now, here are your hosts, John Furrier and Jeff Frick. Okay, welcome back everyone here, live in San Francisco, California, the Moscone Center for Oracle Open World 2014. This is theCUBE, where we go out to the event and extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, the co-founder of SiliconANGLE Media. I'm joined by my co-host Jeff Frick with theCUBE. And our next guest is CUBE alumni Kim Stevenson, Vice President, Chief Information Officer at Intel. Welcome back, CUBE alum, good to see you again. Hi, um, John. On stage with Mark Hurd here at Oracle. Um, what an event, Oracle, the past three years, has turned around from kind of the lull on premise, extracting the rents from their customers in IT to really booting up a transformation of the cloud. Um, Intel has been a big partner this year with Oracle really on stage because you win on your end of the covers. Intel, <laughs> Intel wins with the cloud. Yes. So to explain to the folks out there this convergence with cloud and Intel's role in cloud and particularly Oracle. Yeah, so, um, so Oracle's a great strategic partner for Intel uh, and vice versa, uh, us for them. Uh, and you know, there's there's sort of two themes if I, I think about it. One is sort of the engineered system, right? Which is high performance compute, um, and I I use them at Intel as an example for. Um, in my manufacturing area, big data transfers between machine to machine communication learning so that we get you know, the most output from our manufacturing process. Um, and the latest systems uh, have just been their tremendous performance uh, improvement because our data sets are getting so, so large. And you know, you have to be able to process that to continue um, the manufacturing process. So, um, so that's one thread. The other thread is, you know, the software side of the business, which uh, what I would say is uh, Oracle's in the delivery of enterprise um, business process software. So it's you know CRM, ERP, HCM, all of the the enterprise processes, and um, those as an industry, we're sitting at this pivotal point. It's a shift where those software uh, are moving to the cloud via being consumed via SaaS, but the underlying infrastructure is an infrastructure uh, cloud delivery service, which is scalable and uh, reliable, and frankly, it's cheaper to deliver. So whether you're public cloud or private cloud, the delivery mechanism's going to be the same underneath. Yeah, so in the old famous Larry Ellison Churchill Club video from years ago with uh, talking about the cloud, oh, it's just a bunch of infrastructure. It's true, there's still a lot of compute storage uh, behind the cloud. So yep. the consumption patterns is changing in the business side. So IT has been shifting to a new consumption behavior. Um, What's your take on that with respect to the trends that you see around IT and how they're deploying technology and also being a consumer of, say, Oracle and other yeah. packages? So, What's the big you shift? Know, it's funny, I didn't know I had anything in common with Larry Ellison, but the very first time I heard about the cloud, one of my principal engineers was telling me about it, and it was probably seven or eight years ago, and I said, eh, that's nothing new. Boy, was I wrong. <laughs> Boy, was I wrong. Um, you know, so if you look at the, whether the underlying infrastructure, there is this layer of software abstraction that allows for better manageability, better security, um, and better asset utilization. So, you know, the, I say, you know, generally in an IT shop, the individual servers were running at, you know, 20% utilization, between four and 20%, very low asset utilization. Storage runs less than 40%, fully utilized allocated storage. And you sort of think as an asset owner, that isn't sustainable. So virtualization came to the servers first, allowed you to aggregate those resource pools and more fully utilize it. I have environments now that run 89% utilized and 90% utilized, 100% of the time, 365 days a year. That's happening in storage, now it's going to happen with SDNs and stuff that's going to happen in the network too. And then you're going to start thinking about those technology silos as more of uh, 
aggregated resources, and that gets to software-defined data center, software-defined infrastructure. And again, whether you're the apps you're going to run on that, they, they could be SaaS apps that you're delivering to many customers, or they can be your individual apps that you're going to keep on-prem for things that are what I'll call your core differentiating value of, um, of the company. And so for me, it's design engineering and manufacturing. So Jeff and I were talking before you came on. What are we going to talk about with Kim? There's so much to talk about, but one of the things that Jeff wanted to talk about, I agreed with, was how IT is being evaluated. We want to get your perspective on this because you're also, you have, you run the IT at Intel, you know you guys are early adopters and bleeding edge. Also you talk to a lot of customers and as a lead into the question, Jeff Kelly at Wikibon recently did a survey uh, with uh, customers uh, where they took about, took about Hadoop in particular, but it's more of a reference to the conversation point is that the evaluation was how is IT doing with Hadoop? IT gave themselves great grades. Oh yeah, we deployed clusters, we're in a POC. On the business side, the grades weren't as good. Yeah. So you saw the new dynamic of the business outcome mark side of the market, which is the business owners, and the IT guys thinking they're doing great because they're deploying, they're, they're checking the boxes. How should IT be evaluated with that kind of in context? Is, mm -hmm. is there now multiple stakeholders that need to be taken and is this the same old game? Why do you, what's your take on that? Well, so, so I would tell you that um, there are really four value vectors that an IT organization can deliver. So um, first you have to be IT efficient, right? So IT efficiency, and that's cost performance just like any part. Then business efficiency. So think about IT at any company is two to six percent of revenue. You really want the 94 to 98 percent of the rest of the business to be efficient, and that's through technology that enables that. Then you got to help your business grow. Right, growth kills a lot of ills at companies. Uh, <laughs> and and I, I can give you some examples of how we're helping Intel grow. But then, then there's the soft part that's traditionally difficult for IT to justify, and that's employee productivity. Um, and so I always say things like, I remember justifying IM. I, I couldn't justify it from an ROI perspective, but instant messaging is a, you know, a productivity enhancer. And so there's always stuff like that, and now you're, you're seeing the use of social and stuff inside the company for frictionless information flow. And they're hard to justify, but employee productivity is a big part of it. So, so that's, I always measure, that's how we should be evaluated against those four value vectors. Um, you know, you mentioned Hadoop and the difference in of the business unit in IT. So, you know, Hadoop on its own, um, full disclosure, you know, I'm, I'm on the board of Cloudera, so I have an opinion. But on its own, it's, it's biased opinion. A biased opinion, <laughs> yeah, biased opinion. But you know, it's hard, right? You, you have to layer something on top, an analytics engine, you know, some um, uh, ability to do something. And so that's why the business units find it hard. I had a project in IT. We were using another um, uh, uh, product, not a Hadoop product. We moved to Hadoop in 10 weeks, cut the cost significantly. Um, and so there is this huge, the entree of this world is you'll see storage cost management and cost reduction and utilization, but then you're going to see a layering of application capabilities on top of that that are going to really bring high value. And the marketing firms are the best ones today. They're the most mature in this space, but it'll grow into, I think, all industries. So, so Kim, I wonder, just to expand on your, you, you know, how do you get ROI on, on instant messaging? I think that's interesting, but there's a huge trend that we talk talked about a lot in terms of the consumerization of IT, in that people have an expectation of the way an application should perform based on the way they interact with Amazon, the way they interact with Facebook, the way they interact with Google, these you know, hyperscale single application companies, and they're, the younger ones especially coming to work yeah. have that same expectation. So you've got that trend, and then you've got the uh, their ability to throw a credit card down to spin up a VM at AWS to do a little project. So I wonder if you could talk about you know, the challenges that those those two trends uh, present and how you deal with them in your day-to-day -day world. Yeah, so, um, so first of all, you have to accept that I always thought there's a time BG before Google that in the BG era, you could, you did IT for the enterprise and for the business process and it was better than anything you could get in the consumer market and so, so users would just consume whatever you had and they actually went to like a classroom and got trained. Like, no one will do that anymore. Right, right. right? How do I, like, and VPN works? You, <laughs> you now are in this area where consumer IT is better. 
than enterprise IT. And that's what, as, as professionals in the industry, we have to grab onto that. It means shifting your um, emphasis to be more user-centric. So it's not about a single service, it's about how those services interact with one another. And search is a great example, because for one of our biggest challenges, and I would say I'm not alone, is our employees finding the information they need. We're a big company. Finding the information they need easily. So within, they can, your, within your own Yeah, so archive. they'll go do a Google search or a Bing search on the internet and they can get you know, a whole bunch of information. They come inside and they can't get everything. Why? Because I lock down some things that I don't want people to see because we don't have the right metadata tags and we don't have automated da data tagging capabilities. These things prevent that experience and we have to change that. So I'm working really hard to change that. But let me tell you, that's a couple of years. Right, you, you, we have you know, 45 years of data history at Intel, and most of it's not data tagged, and so we're right, going to have to right. go through some. Um, and not hundreds of purpose-built PhDs that are specifically tackling that, that problem. Right, 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 right. And then what so, about the shadow IT thing? How is that, because I, I would say there's probably going to be a time before Amazon or AWS in this equation too, where yeah. people didn't have that ability and they were happy to wait and, and re make a request that things went through acquisitions. Yeah. Now, you don't have that you don't have that advantage anymore. So how yeah. has that kind of changed things and how are you so providing actually, better service? Yeah, I, um, I embrace shadow IT. I actually hate the label shadow IT. And here's why. So all businesses are becoming digital businesses. And the more your customers are technology literate, the better. Um, so what, what drives me crazy is this idea that you sell to either the business or IT, that you sell around. And I hear a lot of vendors talk about that. Oh, I can't go to IT, but to go sell around it. And I'm like, you're crazy. You're just, you're going to slow your sales cycle. Because what you should be doing is bringing, unifying, letting, letting the company partner together to bring the best of uh, what the solution can so be. you're saying that's a cultural issue then. So yeah. there's two issues. There's one, bypassing IT is also one, dysfunctional. I can get away with it to a point, but at some point it becomes very toxic. Is that what you're saying? Because yeah. yeah. the culture should be partnering with IT. Yeah, and, and look, I, I think we made the bed we Of course, as a CIO, in. you don't want anyone bypassing yeah, IT. But, <laughs> I, but, but I, I get it, because we made the bed, we trained people that were difficult to work with, and so therefore they're going to go find an easier way to work. What we have to do is change our behavior trying to enable the advancement of the business through the adoption of technology. And, um, and we've got to do that in partnership with the business. We, you know, we partner really closely with our marketing team, as an example, um, and uh, they just, they're marketing domain experts. They know things that we won't know, but we know things they won't know. Right, so it's right. a complement of skills. So just to get drilled down on the shadow IT things, that's important, because, but you, you have, we've talked about this before, you've yeah. essentially, from the top said, no shadow IT because why do in the shadows, it's on the open. Yeah. You guys have operationalized what people, why people are using mm -hmm. shadow IT. So it really comes down from the top. The mm -hmm. CIO has to put down, and put, how does a CIO, one, get a handle on shadow IT, if it's happening? Um, using APS, is it just simply a mandate? Is it a cultural shift? Is it, you put a new lieutenant in place? What happens? Well, um, I, I saw this stat earlier this year, and I believe it's true, that 0% of, of businesses know today all of the services, IT services they're consuming. And I believe that's right, we don't know. We don't know everything we're doing. So there are some cool new security products out there that give you some visibility into what people are consuming. Um, and I think that that's a, a, we've been implemented, I think that's an important step. But, so we can create that visibility, but you really have to, I, I went to the business and I said, how do you, what are your strategic objectives? What business problems do you have? And I said, how do you think you're going to accomplish those? Do you think you can accomplish that without information technology? Not the organization, the capability. Well, no, of course I can't. It's a digital world, right? I'm like, well, don't you think you should expect more of us than to simply keep the lights on? You should ha expect us to help transform. And that changed the dialogue. Yeah. Now, right? And how changed about kind of the application centricness? You know, is there, a, I, w I assume, a lot more kind of application demands coming out of the business side that they're asking you to help out with versus, you know, kind of pure infrastructure and yeah. big projects and yeah. HR and keeping the, uh, you know, yeah. keeping the fabs well, running, those types of right. projects. So, so process the bit, Business process simplification is a next big endeavor across the industry because 
you know, whether you've grown through um, acquisitions and, um, or expansion, geographic expansion, you know, we, we, in big companies, we've let processes be developed and grown organically, and now there's differences. And so as you go, go to these big cloud applications, um, you have to have process standardization, and that's a partnership with the business to make that happen. In the process of standardizing, you design for your future, what you really need it to be, right? And so it's it's, um, it's, it's a challenge, but it is what IT is good at, right? We're right. really right. good at change agents, being change agents for the company. So one of the themes coming out of the show here, obviously is the Salesforce.com competitive thing that Larry talked about yesterday, but one thing that's not being talked about that uh, heavily online, but did get teased out by Larry, is this marketing cloud. Yeah. And so we've talked about this before on theCUBE where you, know, you talked about consumer IT earlier and BG before Google. So what's the AG after Google? Because we're now kind of Google's out there. With respect to data-driven competitive advantage, meaning if all things in business could be instrumented mm -hmm. with data, then technically an organization should have visibility on all aspects of their business in real time, which we see as a shift, not 100% there yet obviously, but the marketing cloud is one kind of yeah. teaser to not just selling stuff to customers, but engaging the customers, which speaks to the growth. Mm -hmm. How do you talk to this trend of everything's being instrumented, you should have all aspects of data in real time. How do they get that going? How does an IT person get to that moonshot position? Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I can I'll speak to what we, so our company going through the shift that we're in, right, from PCs to mobile um, and Internet of Things. And so one thing you know about compute is compute gets smaller and smaller and smaller and more powerful every time. That's Moore's Law. So, you know, we really had to assess our marketing message. You know, we have a great brand, but not a brand that's relevant for the future markets. And we're Intel inside. We're inside the PC and inside the server. Um, and so we really sat down with marketing and um, tried to help them underst us understand what their challenges were. How do we, you know, by the way, they weren't getting any more marketing money, right? So we said, well, could we make it more effective? And so the example I gave this morning was, you know, we implemented social listening, campaign management, data management, um, and marketing automation using a lot of Oracle solutions to create a uh, new pipeline. And we went from marketing qualified leads costing $300 per qualified lead to $25 per qualified lead in less than two years. Wow. What other function has got driven that much productivity in that amount of time? Right, and um, that's Now the leads get huge. more complicated because now you got social. Yeah. Now you have email addresses, that's old leads, but now you got new oh, leads. If so. I never received another email from a marketing, I mean, I just delete them all. It's yeah. such an yeah. antiquated way to do business yeah. now, right? Yeah. It's all about the engagement that you can get through social. So we got to talk to you about um, one of our favorite topics because uh, we were, also we love women in tech because we've been, that's now fashionable. We've been loving women in tech from the, from the beginning of the cube. You're actually doing some great work in uh, ladies in tech. Share with us mm -hmm. what's happening with the role of women in tech, especially around computer science and science degrees, industry acceptance, board seats. Uh, you're on the board of Cloud Air, great company we're friends of with yeah. uh, Mike Olson, Amr, great, great company. What's going on? What is the status of women in tech? A lot of momentum, a lot of great buzz, quality yeah. people. Give us the quick update. So I'm. I am very, very positive on progress, um, but I'm a, I'm a glass, you know, half full kind of gal. Um, so, from an Intel perspective, you know, we're we're really investing um, in girls in a full pipeline. So, we, we, it starts with girls in countries that aren't allowed to go to school. So there are places in the world that that's true. We're trying to enable them to go to school. Um, we're offering scholarships in some cases to help them be able to go on to university if they graduate, right? Then in, in school, you know, we're, we do everything from local reach out where our employees reach out through volunteer programs like running, you know, uh, after school programs in tech to training teachers around the world. We've trained millions of teachers around the world to coming out with great tablet products that can be used um, in the classroom and in many cases, um, you know, I had one team go to a place in um, South America out on an island um, to build a school. And uh, there's no electricity on the island, but we wanted to put Wi-Fi in. So what we did, we put solar panels on the roof. So they have Wi-Fi, but no electricity. 
So we are, we're just really trying to build a whole pipeline. Um, but when, when you get into the workplace, you know, um, women often feel a sense of isolation, you're the only one on the team, right? It's, um, styles are different, men and women have different communication styles, and so I spend a lot of time trying to help people understand that different isn't good or bad, different is different. Different is different, right. Different is different, and, and then once we different. understand each other, <laughs> yeah. right, where you might be coming from, you can see the wisdom in what somebody is saying, so, so a lot of great progress. And with connected technologies, Internet of Things, you get more internet access from remote places, people can collaborate, really changing that whole consumer game. Yeah, yeah, really yeah, fascinating. yeah, so. Well, Kim, final, final note, tell, uh, share with the folks out here um, your perspective at Oracle Open World this year. Share the big, uh, big story from your perspective, from Intel, Oracle, your keynote up on stage, talking to customers with Mark Hurd. What's the buzz here? What's your view of 2014 Oracle Open World? Yeah, so um, first of all, the energy is amazing. I was here at seven o'clock and people were lined up to get in. So um, it's always, it's exciting to be around, you know, a bunch of like-minded people. Um, but so the, bi the big um, thing is, is I'll say to cloud or not cloud, cloud is happening. My view is it's going to be a hybrid world. Oracle showing you uh, here how to go um, hybrid with Intel um, helping, and um, you know it's our view is you know everything's going to be smart and connected, and we're going to make sure that that works best on Intel. Kim, thanks for coming on the Cube. Really appreciate you coming on. Great work here, Intel. Obviously, Intel Inside is really uh, paying off the bet in the cloud you guys made years ago. We've been documenting it. You know, big risk for Intel to bet a lot on the cloud. You know, five years ago, now paying off. You guys are in, inside the cloud, and again, compute, compute's just not going anywhere. It's still in the cloud. It's somewhere. You still need servers <laughs> to power things, as we always say. Um, the cloud can't run without infrastructure. This is the Cube. We'll be live in San Francisco. We'll be back with our next guest after this short break.